I'm trying. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. We're thankful for those that are here. It's good to have Volley and Patrick with us. And my son, Lawrence, he's here with us today. And it's also we have uh, Sophia with us. So it's a blessing to have everyone here with us. And uh, I've been told that we should have some new people visiting with us today online, Kathy and Butch. By the way, I like that name, Butch. Um, so if you are watching, thank God for you being here. Let's begin this morning by taking our hymnals. Turn to hymn number 477, hymn 477 at Calvary, 477. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. Knowing not it was for me, he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned, till my guilty soul in boring turned to Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdens of and liberty at Calvary. I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly owe him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burden soul my liberty. I Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty God that God did span. I Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There, my burdens of my liberty at Calvary. Amen. Take your hymnals and turn over one page to hymn number 478. Hymn 478. Constantly abiding. Hymn 478. in thy heart that the world never gave a peace it cannot take away though the trials of life may surround like a cloud I have a peace that has come there to stay constantly abiding Jesus is mine, constantly abiding, rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely, whispers are so kind. I will never leave thee, Jesus is mine. All the world sees. To sing of a Savior and King when peace sweetly came to my 
my heart. Troubles all fled away, and my night turned to day. Blessed Jesus, the glorious Thou art, constantly abiding. Jesus is mine, constantly abiding. Rapture divine. He never leaves me lonely. Whispers also. Next page over in your hymnal, we're going to sing Jesus Loves Me. Hymn number 479. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died, heaven's gate to open wide, he will wash away my sin, let his little child come in, yes, Jesus loves me. Beside me all the way, thou hast fled and died for me. I will henceforth live for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. haven't done this in a while, but how many of you just sang the truth? Now immediately you're thinking, of course I did. I know Jesus loves me. But you just sang, thou hast bled and died for me. I will henceforth live for thee. Did you sing a truth or did you just lie? Will you henceforth, because Jesus died for you, live for him? Makes me think of another song. I'll live for him who died for me. 
precious land of Calvary. <laughs> All right, let's take our hymnals and turn to Revelation chapter number one. Revelation chapter number one. All right, we'll put the mic back on. Hopefully, the volume will be good again. My son Lawrence says he doesn't think it sounds as good as the old mic, but it seemed to have less of the going up and down as the old mic. So I'll continue to put it out there so you can hear everyone else when we're singing and bring it back when, we're, when I'm preaching. We're going to begin looking this morning in verse number 9 of Revelation chapter number 1. Verse number 9. I'm going to read all the way down to verse number 20. The Bible says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that speak with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Today we're going to begin our study of this fourth and final paragraph of Revelation chapter 1. And I'm sure everyone automatically wants to get down to that last verse. What are the seven stars and what do they represent? But hold on, we'll get there. In fact, if you know me, it might be a couple of weeks before we get there. We've already seen so much as a way of introduction and understanding of this epistle that was written to the seven churches. And we're not going to go back over all of what we learn, but we do know that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I've emphasized it again and again and again, that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the revelation of the Antichrist, not the revelation of the beast, not the revelation of the false prophet, not the revelation of everything else that's coming and going. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And how do we know that? It says the revelation of Jesus Christ. We know it was written by John as it was signified to him by an angel. We know there's a blessing attached to reading, hearing, and keeping the words of this prophecy. We know the audience is the seven churches that we just read about here in this paragraph. But we also learned a little bit about Jesus. We learned he's coming. We learned that every eye will see him and that all kindreds of the earth will wail because of him. And last week we heard from Jesus himself as he interjected himself into this prophecy. And he let us know that he is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. It all started with him and it's all going to end with Jesus. John then verified that Jesus is Lord, who is, who was, and who is to come. And he said that he is the Almighty. And that's just a quick synopsis of the first eight verses. But today we're going to begin with verse 9 and continue this paragraph that ends in verse number 20. I've got this written in my notes that I don't see a way that 
knowing me that there's any way I could complete everything from verse 9 to verse 20 in one message. So we're going to see how many it takes. And my plan, my plan originally was three weeks. Today I wanted to handle verse 9 through verse 11. Next week I wanted to handle verse 12 down to verse 16. And then I wanted to handle verse 17 to 20 the following week. And I know some of you might think that that's a long time, but I want to handle this text properly. And the truth be told, we're not even going to get through to his first three verses today. We're going to get to verse 9. And that's about it. And I pray that this message will once again be a help and will help us better understand Jesus and this prophecy. I pray that as we look at these first, this first verse of this fourth paragraph, that God will use it in our lives. I pray that this message will be a blessing and help to all who hear it. And I want you to understand that this text, beginning here in verse number 9, is the beginning of the first vision that John has in the book of Revelation. And it begins here in chapter 1, verse 9, and continues on to the end of chapter number 3. It's all one vision. So what he tells to the churches in chapter 2 and chapter 3 is what he is told in this first vision. And so that's important for us to understand. And my proposition is this, that every believer must know how the first vision John received begins. Let's take a moment to pray, and then we're going to begin looking in verse 9. Father, we thank you for the day. Father, we ask that once again you would help the stream to go well. Father, I know that there's been some problems lately with our internet. But Father, simply put, you are God. Father, and even the airwaves, Father, and the radio waves, and the signals from the Wi-Fi, Father, you can control them. Father, we ask that you would help it to go smooth so everyone can see and hear what you have for us today from your word. Father, so then we can be fed as the sheep of your pasture. Lord, again, we thank you for those that are here. Father, it's so good to have Lawrence and Volley and Patrick and Sophia here. And Father, for anyone new who may be joining us, Father, what a blessing it is. And I pray that this message will be a help. Lord, now as always, I ask you to hide me behind the cross of Christ and may the Holy Ghost fill me and use me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you look at me, we'll see how verse number 9 begins. It begins with two words, which is the title of our message. And it'll continue to be the title of our message until we're finished this fourth paragraph and chapter 1. And it's I, John. And it's really quite simple. All John is doing is verifying that he is the one who is communicating this message that was signified, this revelation of Jesus Christ that was signified to him. He is the one who is communicating it to the seven churches. Go back to verse number 1. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. And then verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. And we already know what we need to know about John. And we know that from verse number 2. Speaking of John, it says, Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So, this whole book begins with telling us, basically, that John is a trustworthy source. And we can believe what he writes down for us and what was given to him by this angel. But I want you to notice how he begins here. I, John, who also am your brother. Now, again, here's a simple thing that I believe many people would just skip over, many pastors would just ignore, but I think it's vitally important. And I don't, I don't believe I can overemphasize how important this is. Because John doesn't say, I, John, the prophet of God. He doesn't say, I, John, the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, what does he say? He doesn't say, I, John, the one who laid his head on Jesus' breast. No, what does he say? I, John, who also am your brother. He's showing that he is one with the people. That he is a part of these people. He is their brother as a part of the church. He's not above the church. He's not the leader of the church. He's just one of the brethren in the church. And I think he got this proper understanding from Jesus. Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter number 23. And we get to Matthew chapter 23. We're going to look at verse number 8.
And listen to what Jesus said. Be, but be not ye called, Matthew 23, 8, but be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. He doesn't say we have the, you know, the clergy and the laity. He says, no, you're all on equal footing. By the way, you're all guilty before Christ and at the foot of the cross, right? He didn't say some of you are special and some of you aren't. You're all guilty before God. You're all condemned before God. You're all in need of a Savior. Just because I'm a pastor and God's called me to be a pastor doesn't mean I'm better than anyone else. In fact, if I take my calling seriously, that should make me more of a servant than those who haven't been called. Because it's exactly what God calls a pastor to do. Take your Bibles, turn to verse number 10. Again, Jesus says, Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Take your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1. And when you get there, go all the way down to verse number 24. And listen to what Paul says here. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. Paul. For many of us, we believe, probably, one of the, probably the greatest Christian who ever lived. And you know what he says? I don't have dominion over your faith. No. He says, but I'm here to help you and be a help to you for your joy. But it's by faith that you stand, not by what I do for you. Look at chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians, chapter number 4, and verse number 5. Again, listen to Paul, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Paul didn't say, I'm preaching to you about how good I am. By the way, there are preachers that will preach to you about them. I'm the man of God. No, you aren't. Touch not God's anointed. You know what I like to say when I hear preachers say that? Twist not the scriptures. <laughs> That's talking about a king in the time of the nation of Israel. That's who God's anointed was. It's not talking about a preacher this side of the cross. No, you know what Jesus said about a preacher this side of the cross? Y'all are brethren. You know what Paul said about you in the beginning of 1 Corinthians? That you're based, that you're nothing, and that the things that are nothing he could actually use. So if you don't think you're nothing, you're not a good preacher. Amen. 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 It's really that simple. Look at James chapter 3. James chapter 3. James gives a warning here to anybody who wants to be a preacher or teacher. James 3, 1, my brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. By the way, you're going to give account for the things that you preach and teach. And if you preach and teach you, you're going to give a real account. Just preach and teach Jesus. It's easier that way. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5. And if you're new to us and I use a lot of scripture, then just say praise God. Amen? Amen. I mean, if I'm not preaching the word of God, then I'm preaching the wrong thing. But 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3, Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples or examples to the flock. It's not my job to be a lord over God's heritage. You belong, this is God's flock. This is the flock of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not the lord over it. I'm just a servant within it. I'm an under-shepherd, if you will. You see, John understood what Jesus taught. Go again back to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And we're going to look at this same thing in all three Gospels. And it's repeated more than once in the Bible. By the way, if you see something repeated in the Bible, it's probably important. Matthew chapter 20. And look at me in verse number 25 and 26. The Bible says, But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them. And they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Look at Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse number, 20, verse number 42. And down to verse 45. But Jesus called them to him, Mark 10, 42, and said unto them, 
ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister, and whosoever you will be the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus said, hey, I set an example for you. And you know what my example was? You're not to be the one looking to be served. You're the one looking to serve. Look at Luke 22. Luke chapter 22. Beginning in verse number 24. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief is he that doeth, doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you as he that serveth. You know, a sad truth is the vast majority of those who are pastors today don't understand this simple teaching. Who also am your brother. What they do is they exercise lordship over others all the time. And you know what many of them do? They demand loyalty to them and obedience to them. If you don't listen to me. In fact, I even know of pastors less than two hours from here. He used to be alive. He's dead now. Well, you know what he would say? You'll only marry who I tell you to marry. But doesn't that sound like grace? No. John, however, saw and stated the truth that he was simply one of the brethren. I like what John Gill said here. He said, here begins the narrative of the visions and prophecies of this book. The former verses containing a general preface to the whole. And this and the two following verses are the introduction to the first vision. While John saw, who described himself by his name, I, John, the evangelist and apostle, a servant of Christ and a beloved disciple of his, one that was well known to the seven churches to whom he writes, and who had no reason to doubt of his fidelity in the account he gives them, and also by his relation to them as a brother. Not in a natural, but in a spiritual sense. They and he belonging to that family that is named of Christ, to the household of God and the faith, and having one and the same Father, even God. Thus, though he was an elder, an evangelist, yea, an apostle by office, yet he puts himself on a level with the several members of these churches as he was a believer in Christ. <laughs> a couple hundred years ago, preachers understood that. John Gill said, you know what John does? He says, I'm just one of you all. I'm not something special. John goes on to say, and companion in tribulation. So we've seen that John reintroduced himself and shows that he's just one of them. And here he not only asserts that he's one of them in brotherhood, but also in suffering. John states that he is their companion. And this is the Greek word, sonkoinonos. Sonkoinonos. And it's only used four times in the whole New Testament. And everywhere else it's translated. It's translated as partaker, partake. Or partakest. Or partaker, partakers, or partakest. And that's in Romans 11, 17, 1 Corinthians 9, 23, and Philippians 1, 7. And the proper meaning of this word is just this. When he says he's your companion, he's one who participates in or partakes in the same thing that another person participates or partakes in. There's another way of saying it, if you will. John, I, John, who am also your brother and Co-participant in tribulation. You know what he says? You're not the only one going through it. I am too. So he just said, I'm not special. I'm just your brother. And guess what? I'm going through it just like you're going through it. I'm getting ready to tell you how bad things are going to get in the future. But guess what? I'm going through it too. It's a way of comforting the people. So John not only was one of them in the brotherhood, but also one of them in suffering. He's a co-participant in the tribulation that they've been enduring. And I like what Herman Hoxima said, the church was in tribulation then, 
And according to the viewpoint of the book of Revelation, she is always in tribulation in the midst of the world. Let me say something. And I'm going to show this from the Bible in just a minute, but if the church is doing it right, they're going to have tribulation in this world. They're not going to be accepted. They're not going to be loved. They're not going to be lauded for all the great things they do. No, they're going to be hated if they're doing it God's way. Tribulation and suffering is commonplace for the church. And we see that borne out in the New Testament. Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 10. Now we're going to run through a bunch of scriptures here. But Matthew chapter 10. And we're not going to read all of this, but we're going to begin in verse 17. And we could go all the way down to verse 39. But we're not going to read all the way down there. But Jesus said, actually beginning in verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents, and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. And you can finish reading all the way down to verse 39. You know what Jesus says? Hey, if you do it the Bible way, if you do it my way, they are going to hate you. They're going to want to kill you. They're not going to love you. Look at John chapter 16. John chapter 16. And when you get there, let's look at verse 33. John chapter 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You know, what I think is interesting is there's people when they give what they call the Romans order of salvation, they always like to say, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth. And they make an emphasis on how strong the word shall is. And shalt believe in thine heart that God is the reason that thou shall be saved. They make such an emphasis because that's such a strong word and it is. But how come they don't make the same emphasis here? In the world ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Look at Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14. <clears throat> Look at me in verse number 21, 22. And when they had preached the gospel to the city, to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and, I, and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter number 8. And let's look at verse number 16 and 17. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. Now look at Romans chapter 12 and verse number 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. I'm trying to show you that throughout the Bible it is a fact that it's shown that the church and believers will continuously be in tribulation. They will constantly be going through it. The world will continuously be hating them. Take your Bible, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. And look at me in verse number 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3, verse number 4. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, 
and ye know. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Most of you probably already know these verses here. And look at me in verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Listen, I'm going to give you one, one from 1 Peter. Take your Bible, turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. But if you really want to learn about the church and Christians going through persecution, just read all of 1 Peter. Really, that's what the whole of 1 Peter is about. But 1 Peter chapter 4, look at me in verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yea, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. As I said, you can really read all of 1 Peter and it talks about the fact that Christians are going to suffer. So John's letting these Christians know. He's letting these seven churches know that he's one of them. Not only in the brotherhood of being a Christian, not only as part of the church, but I'm one of you in suffering too. If tribulation is commonplace for the church, according to the Bible, and then I have a question for you. If you and your church have none... What does that say? What does that say about you and your church? Is it possible to be a Christian without tribulation? If the Bible promises tribulation to Christians. Are you telling me God's a liar? I mean, if, listen, if your Christianity is happy and go lucky, and you can do and say whatever you want. You don't teach your kids anything and things of God and there's no persecution coming your way, then you got it wrong. It's not the Christianity of the Bible. Plain and simple. Can you be a church without the world opposing you? A true Bible church? If the Bible says specifically the tribulations over Christians in the church will have in this world, and you don't have it, you better take a good hard look at your confession. And if you have it, but your church doesn't take a good hard look at your church. I stated before, we're not going to argue the date of the writing of this book. But whether this was during Nero or Domitian, it doesn't really matter. Because the church and believers were suffering great tribulation and suffering death. Both of those men had no problem putting Christians to death. And why? We're going to see why, the main thing, in just a minute. But why? Because they refused to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. So John is their brother and companion in tribulation, but it doesn't leave off with the bad stuff, tribulation. He says, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm your companion, I'm your co-participant, I'm your joint heir, I'm your partaker with you in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. And what a great truth that though we're suffering, though we're going through tribulation, we're not of this world. But rather, we've been translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter number 14. And let's look at verse 17 and 18 of Romans 14. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now take your Bibles, turn to Colossians chapter number 1. Colossians chapter number 1. And look at me in verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom 
of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now take your Bibles from the second Thessalonians chapter number one. Second Thessalonians chapter number one. And we're going to begin in verse 4 and read down to verse 10. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of Christ for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in the saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Now I want you to go back and see something. Verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. He didn't say for which ye will suffer, for which ye also suffer. They were already suffering for the kingdom of God's sake. I want to tell you that you're going to suffer persecution when you say that your Lord, your King, is not of this world. When you tell the world, I cannot disobey God to obey you. They don't like it. And I can prove that from the Bible. Take your Bibles, turn to Esther chapter 3. Esther chapter number 3. Just before Job, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. I want you to hear this. Verse 8, And Haman said unto king Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they the king's laws. Therefore it is not for the king's prophet to suffer them. You know what? Haman didn't like the fact that there was a man who said, I can't bow to you. I got a God. And so you know what he says? I'm going to get rid of all of them. By the way, when one Christian stands up and people don't like it, then people want to get rid of all the Christians. Maybe we all need to start standing up. Look at Daniel chapter number 3. Daniel chapter number 3. If you get to Hosea, you went too far. If you're Isaiah, you didn't go far enough. Daniel chapter number 3. And look at verse 12. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abed Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And every time we hear that, we should say, Amen! Amen. They're not bowing to the government. They're not bowing to the kings of this world. They say, No, we can't bow to you. And no matter what you do, we don't care because we have a God who will take care of us. But they don't want to hear that. That's not what is preached today in most churches. You know what it is? Capitulate. Give in. Just be undercover Christian. No. No. How can you be an undercover Christian when Jesus said, don't hide your light? Look at August. Acts chapter 4. I don't know where August came from. Acts chapter 4. And look at me in verse number 19. Acts chapter 4, verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. But we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. They said, Don't you go out preaching in Jesus' name. Yeah, all right. <laughs> I can't help but tell people what happened to me and what I saw. And whether you think it's night right or not, I'm going to go do it, so do what you got to do. You're not going to stop me. The only way you're going to stop me is when you try to shut my mouth and you can't do that if God won't let you. Take your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Now see, we all like to quote that, but listen to the rest of this. This is just powerful. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. 
Him hath God exalted with a right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. You know what they said? We all obey God rather than men. And you know what? I saw this. And you all killed him. But I'm going to tell everybody about it. I'm going to tell them that y'all need to repent. You need to repent towards God and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to shut up. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to do any of those things because I know the truth. And I'm going to share it. Look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. I'm telling you, the world does not like it when you will not bow to their God. When you not, will not bow to their perceived authority. Acts chapter 17, verse 6 and 7. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the elders of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these also do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. You see, it kind of tells you what's going on right now in the world. Back in that time, they had to confess that Caesar was God. And you know what they said? He's not our king. We got a king. And if you want to know his name, it's Jesus the Christ. Jesus Christ, Jesus Messiah for all you Jewish people. If you don't understand Christ in the Greek. Just a simple translation of Messiah. But during that time, people had to stand and say these words. Kaiser Curios. Which means Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. And true Christians couldn't do so. Instead, they testified that Jesus was king. And that they ought to obey him rather than men. Here's a question for you. Who do you confess as Lord? Just yesterday in the car, we were talking about the many Christians who have established Donald J. as their Lord. They've cast off the commandments of God to hold on to the traditions of men. In fact, you know what many of them do? They value and esteem the Constitution above the written, revealed Word of God. And instead of suffering tribulation, you know what they want to do? They want to inflict harm. Upon those who tread on their liberty. You know, we have a bunch of Christians going on, doing today. They run around using non biblical mottos like, The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. By the way, you know who said that? Thomas Jefferson, a man who hated Jesus so much that he took his own Bible and cut out every uh, thing that was a miracle or that Jesus did that was supernatural and made him divine and then said, oh, that's all I want to know is the teachings of the philosopher Jesus. That sounds like a good Christian witness we should listen to, huh? Yeah, surely! By the way, have you ever known, have any of y'all ever heard that quote before? From time to time. Or the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of, you know what they always leave out? They leave out the patriots part. They say, with the blood of tyrants! You know what he's saying? From time to time, we just got to have big wars and let a bunch of people die. Uh, no, you don't. No, you don't. You can just serve Jesus. We were talking about it yesterday. Listen, if everyone during the, during the revolutionary, not the revolutionary, during the civil war that was in America who claimed the name of Jesus Christ, if every one of them then said, no, I will not raise up arms against a brother in Christ, there would have been no civil war. We would not have two countries, but there would have been no civil war. Or there had been reconciliation. Look at John chapter 14 and verse 15. John chapter 14. You know, you may be new and you may be saying, I've never heard anyone preach like this. Well, praise God, you're hearing it today. John chapter 14, verse 15. Jesus said, If ye love me, keep my commandments. He didn't say, If you love me, keep the Constitution. By the way, you know, we have a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians, I didn't say Mormons. A lot of Christians today who want to deify the Constitution. They want to make it uh, inspired. By the way, do you know Mormons believe the U.S. Constitution is inspired? That's scary when you think about it, especially when you think one of them actually ran for president. And there was a lot of Christians who were dumb enough to vote for him. 
Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, yet they cast off the teachings of Jesus on non-resistance to adhere to the traditions of men. And you know what they do? They adhere to the teachings of the just war theory by the Catholic Augustine. They don't want to listen to anything else Catholic, but Augustine said, sometimes there's a good reason to go to war. Jesus said, no. Augustine says, yes. They say, Augustine is the one we should listen to. No. You listen to Jesus. Somebody comes and smacks you in the face, you don't shoot them. What do you do? What did Jesus say? You do what? You turn the other cheek. In fact, you know what Jesus did? He warned us about this type of stuff. Look at Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. The scribes and Pharisees came to Jesus and they asked him this question in verse 2. Why do your, thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Listen to what Jesus said. But he answered and said to them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? He said, Why do you have traditions that violate the word of God? We were talking about it yesterday also. I actually preached to the church and I asked them that. In that church, I asked them, Why does your church constitution that says this, doesn't agree with this. But also here in the very church, why do you have that thing in the place of prominence above that thing? Meaning the American flag in the place of prominence above the Christian flag. Why? Is it in your constitution? No. Would the Bible authorize that? Of course not. But you know what it does? The flag code. Who cares about the flag code? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Look at Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, again, we'll see a warning from Jesus. Mark 17, verse 12 and 13. Mark 7, verse 12 and 13. And ye suffer, and ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered. And many such like things do ye. Jesus warned them there's a lot of people that go and because of their traditions, what they have done. It's the way we do it in America. It's the way we do it in Ireland. It's the way we do it in England. It's our way of doing it. You know what they do? They throw aside the Bible so they can do it their way. The tradition of men. By the way, Paul warned about this too. Look at Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 8. I like the way Paul puts it. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rumors of the world, and not after Christ. He says, don't allow anyone to spoil you. Beware of them who come to you with the traditions of men, with philosophies, with vain deceits, with the rudiments of the world that are going to take you away from Christ. If they're trying to get you to do them instead of the things of Christ, beware of those people. But here we have John not calling for these people to take up arms and fight. He says, I'm your companion in tribulation. He didn't say, so let's go have war. No, it's not at all what he did. He rather stating that he was their companion in tribulation. And what should they also be companions in? Patience. Don't you love it? I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. I just want to see throughout this study, patient endurance is called for in the book of Revelation. I, listen, I, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. I've got 13 verses that I'm not going to turn to that are all written in my notes about patience and patient endurance being taught to these seven churches in the book of Revelation. I'll quickly give you the, revelation, the uh, references, Revelation 2, 2 and 3, Revelation 2, 13, Revelation 2, 19, Revelation 3, 10, Revelation 6, 11, 13, 10, 14, 12, 16, 15, 18, 4, 24, 22, 7, 22, 11, 22, 14. And just because I went too fast, Revelation 2, 2, and 3. 
There's some sweet people that need to take their time and write it. Revelation 2.13. Revelation 2.19. Revelation 3.10. 6.11. 10. They're all in Revelation, so. 14.12. 16.15. 18, 4, 20, 4, 22, 7, 11, and 14. 7, 11, and 14. And by the way, if you just had me go slow and write all them and don't look them up later, shame on you. But here's a great truth. I'm just picking on my own children. I love them. Here's a great truth. Tribulation. The kingdom and patience are all of Jesus Christ. And it's tribulation because of our relationship with Jesus. It's His kingdom. It's His patience that we've been made partakers of. Matthew Henry wrote, He was their companion in patience, not only a share with them in suffering circumstances, but in suffering graces. If we have the patience of the saints, we should not grudge to meet with their trials. You see, when we have a combination of both suffering and knowing we are a part of Christ's kingdom, you know what he calls for? Have a little patience. Listen, I'm going through it, but I belong to the Lord. I'm part of His kingdom. Then just chill. Be patient. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and He will strengthen thy heart. Albert Barnes summed it up this way. The meaning of this passage is that he and those whom he addressed we're not only companions in afflictions, but we're fellow partners in the kingdom of the Redeemer. That is, they shared the honor and the privileges pertaining to that kingdom. And that they were fellow partners in the patience of Jesus Christ. That is, in enduring with patience, whatever might follow from their being his friends and followers. The general idea is that alike in privileges and suffering, they were united. They shared alike in the result of their attachment to the Savior. Let me make this really simple. John says, hey, I'm your brother. We're partners. He says, but you know what? We're partners in tribulation. We're partners in the kingdom. But we need to be partners in patience too. So just wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. You will see the deliverance of the Lord. Just wait. That's what he's saying here. And he goes on to say, was in the isle that is called Patmos. So now he literally shows them that he's their companion in tribulation. But you notice what he doesn't, he doesn't say who sent them there. You know why? Because that wasn't important. It wasn't important who was doing the persecution, just the fact that there would be persecution. And he's exiled on the Isle of Patmos. And what that shows is he hasn't compromised his convictions. You know what John did not say? He did not say Kaiser Curios. Mm -mm. He said, Jesus. Curios. Jesus is Lord. Not Caesar is Lord. No, Jesus is Lord. That's why he's on this prison island. Ken Motto wrote, When John received his vision of Revelation, he was exiled to Patmos, which is where prisoners were sent at this, as this was a penal colony. Life on Patmos was not a Mediterranean paradise. It was anything but that. So here John is on Patmos, He's about 35 or 40 miles off the coast of Asia Minor, Minor, where these exact churches are that are being written to. And he's southwest of Ephesus. And it's funny, when you look at the, where these churches are, I'm going to kind of do it the way you look. It, it starts here, and they go in a semicircle like this around. And so the first one, Ephesus, would be here. John's just over here on the Isle of Patmos. So the first letter is written to Ephesus, and then it goes in a semicircle around the way you would travel to all the churches. That's exactly how the book of Revelation is given. He says, was in the owl that is called Patmos, and he tells you why, for the word of God. He leaves no doubt as to why he is a prisoner in Patmos. Not because he was a rebel, not because he started an uprising, but because he preached that Jesus is Lord. Not because he preached seditions or was any type of criminal. He was in prison because of the word of God. His uncompromising stand on the word of God sent him to Patmos. He was a person who took the word of God seriously. 
and he held to it. I wonder how many people would have looked at John and said, John, you just hold that thing a little too seriously. I can tell you. I've had people look at me and say, you're too strict in the way you obey the Bible. Now, I laugh when I hear that. You obey the Bible too good. Hurt me. You know, I mean, seriously. Can you obey the Bible too strictly? Is that possible? I've even had people say that the only way, I, the only way you tried to prove your point was with Bible verses. Don't you have anything else? Uh, we were talking about a biblical principle, and I gave you Bible verses, and you said, don't you have anything else? Um, if I'm trying to show you a Bible thing, and I give you a Bible, and you give me nothing, whose point is right? God's is. But I want us to look back at what we know about John. Look at verse 2, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. You see, John had been with Jesus, so he took the word of God seriously. Those who have no relationship with Jesus don't adhere to his word. Albert Barnes wrote, on account of the word of God, that is for upholding and preach, for, for holding and preaching the gospel, the fair interpretation is, in accordance with all the testimony of antiquity, that he was sent there, meaning Patmos, in a time of persecution, as a punishment for preaching the gospel. You see, John wrote or testified and preached Christ. He preached his lordship, his kingdom, and his coming. And you know what that did? That made him an enemy of the state. Where the rulers of the state said, you must say, I'm God. He said, no, you're not. He says, and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John goes even further to say that this island stay was due to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Jesus, Messiah, Jesus, the anointed one, Jesus, the prophesied prince to come. Others who held to the testimony of Jesus Christ, they didn't get an island vacation like John. You know what they got? Take your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter number 6. And look at verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. John held to the word and to his testimony. He got an island vacation. You know I'm being facetious in the way I say that. It was a prison plan. You know, a prison island. Others did the same. And you know what they got? They got to see Jesus. They got death. Revelation chapter 12 and verse number 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. If you understand that, you know what it says? They got killed. Because they loved the Lord Jesus and stood by the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, even if it cost them their life. Look at chapter number 20 of Revelation. Chapter number 20 and verse number 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. You see, this world, its governments, and Satan, they hate those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ and keep it. Listen, if you have the testimony of Jesus Christ, but you're not really keeping it, if you tell people, oh yeah, I love Jesus, and go live like the world and act like the world and do the things the world, the world loves you. But if you have the testimony of Jesus Christ, I'm a Christian, and you live different from the world, you're separate from the world, you call the world out for their sin, they don't love you. They hate you. Look at Revelation chapter 11 and verse 7. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Look at chapter 12 and verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The world... It's governments and Satan hate those who have the testimony of Jesus Christ and keep it. We know John had testified of Jesus Christ. We saw that in verse number 2, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
You see, when we tell others of Jesus and testify of the real Jesus of the Bible, people hate you for it, and they hate it. The world, its governments, and Satan have no concern, and they have no fight against the long-haired, effeminate, hippie Jesus that loves everyone and is going to take everybody to heaven. But they do, however, hate the Jesus of the Bible. They hate the Jesus who said in John 3, 18, that everyone is condemned already. They hate the Jesus in John 3, 19 and 21, who said that people were living in darkness and needed to come to the light, but they hated it. They hate the Jesus who said, if you don't believe in him, you're damned in Mark 16, 16. They hate the Jesus who said, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish in Luke 13, 3 and Luke 13, 5. The testimony of this Jesus who said you either serve and love him or this world, but you can't love both. Luke 16, 13. No man can serve two masters. They hate that Jesus. They hate the Jesus and all of his followers who testify of him. And they'll do everything they can to stop the testimony of Jesus from getting to those who need it. So sending John to Patmos was their way of silencing him. I want you to get that. Did you hear what I just said? They sent John to Patmos to silence him. Um, by the way, what are we reading? What are we studying? Uh, who wrote it down for us? Oh, shucks. They didn't do a good job, did they? You know why? Revelation, I'm sorry, look at Romans chapter 8. You all know it. You probably can just quote it. You don't even need to turn there. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. John loved God. He held to the word of God. He testified to Jesus Christ. And you know what? When they sent him to prison, it all worked out for good. Guess what? I'm glad it worked out for my good. I'm glad I got the book of Revelation. You see, God's plan cannot be stopped by men. As I told you when we began, my original plan was to preach through three verses today. But the truth is, we just got through one. And this first one took a while. And I even shortened it up some. I like what my daughter said again. I was thinking about it when I just gave all those verses instead of reading them. I was thinking how you said you can see the pain on my face sometimes when I don't go into everything I want to. But we're going to pick this back up next week, Lord willing. But I'm going to kind of bring this home a little bit. I want to ask you a couple questions. If we had a court trial held today, and the sentence could be that you would be sent to Patmos, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Are you truly a brother of other believers? Are you suffering with them in tribulation? Do you confess Christ's kingdom is yours and that you're not of this world, but just passing through on your way to that celestial city? Are you patiently waiting on Christ? Or have you decided it's been long enough, I'm going to do things my way? Would you stand and commit to the word of God? Would your stand and commitment to the word of God be evidence against you in trial? Could he actually say, let me show you what he did as he stood committed on the word of God? Or would they be able to say, he didn't take that seriously. Look, he said this, but he did that. Would there be enough of the testimony of Jesus Christ that has been heard from our mouth to get a sentence to the prison called Patmos? You see, John is letting the others who were being persecuted know that they're not alone. He was also suffering but they're still a part of the kingdom. So they need to have patience. They need to have patience, which is what everyone who is indwelt by the Holy Ghost of God should have. You say, well, how do you know everyone who's a Christian should have patience? Well, that's easy. You know what it's called? A fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. That means patient. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. So what about us? 
If we were on Patmos, could we write to other Christians and say, I'm your brother? Could we write to other Christians and say, I'm your companion in tribulation, but I'm your companion in the kingdom too. And I'm also in your companion in tribulation. And I'm your companion in patience. So let's just wait. God's going to work this out. Would there be enough evidence against us saying that we held to the word of God and we gave the testimony of Jesus Christ? But what about the preachers that we have? Are they lording over us? Or are they our brethren and companions in tribulation? You know what I find amazing? How many preachers want to tell you how you got to suffer and give so they can live a good life. God's called you to give more. Oh, so God's going to bless you if you give more? Yeah, well, pastor, you're a multimillionaire. You give to me. Oh, no, they don't want to hear that. I pray that this message has been both a challenge and a help. I pray that while we didn't get as far as I, nor I believe you would have liked to have gotten, Pray that we've seen some truths that we need to internalize. Some truths that need to be engrafted into who we are. Maybe, just maybe, when we hear John say that he's our brethren and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, maybe we say, yes, John, you are our brother. Yes, John, we're a companion with you in tribulation. Yes, John, we're a companion with you in the kingdom. And the patience. John, we know what you're talking about. Now, while I've never been to prison, I know a little bit about a little bit of persecution. People don't like it when you tell the truth, when you preach the truth. Even Paul said, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? You stand for and preach truth, the world will hate you, it's not going to love you. We not only know it, but we've experienced it just as Jesus said we would. I want to say something again. If you've had no tribulation in your Christian life, and you don't see any persecution against the church that you belong to, let me tell you this. Number one, it's time for you to find the true Christian life. And number two, find another church. It's really that simple. If everybody loves your church, the world loves your church, and it's all great, then it's not doing it the Bible way. Because the Bible promises the world, promises the church that the world will hate them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you. Father, even in just one verse, Father, there's so much depth in your word. Father, I pray that you would help us to know these truths, to live these truths, and to share them. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take our hymnals. I'm going to turn to hymn number 481. Hymn number 481. I don't know if you all just heard that noise in the background, but for some reason, the whole time I'm preaching, the air conditioning wasn't kicked on, but it just did. And oh, I'm so thankful. It's a little warm in here, wouldn't you agree? You're not warm? I'm warm. All right. Mr. Patrick over here, he says, can you turn on the heat? <laughs> He's a little cold-blooded. Yep. Probably need to set him out in the sun, in the sunlight. We're going to sing sunlight. Yes. Maybe it'll warm you up a little bit. <laughs> All right. By the way, if you can't have fun when you're with the brethren, then you're doing it wrong. Right? Honestly. Right. I mean, you should have times of conviction with one another, but you should better enjoy your fellowship with one another. Yep. Hymn number 481. <laughs> and by the way, I do like to have fun. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me. And with the sunlight of his love bit of my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight, all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin, 
fire and the sunlight of his love with him. The clouds may gather in the sky and billows round me roll. However dark the world may be, I have sunlight in my soul. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today, today. A sunlight, sunlight all along my narrow way. Since the Savior found me, took away my load of sin. I have had the sunlight of His love within. While walking in the light of God, I sweet communion find. I press with holy vigor on and leave the world behind. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today, today. Yes, sunlight, sunlight all along the narrow way. Since the Savior found me, took away my load of sin. I have had the sunlight of His love with Him. I cross the wide extended fields, I journey o'er the plain, and in the sunlight of his love I reap the golden grain. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today, sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin, I have had the sunlight of his love with him. Soon I shall see him as he is, the light that came to me. Behold the brightness of his face throughout eternity. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have had the sunlight of his love with me. Father, how can we but thank you for your son, for the true light of the world, Father, the sunlight. Father, we ask now that you would help us to do exactly as he said. Father, that we would show we love him by keeping his commandments. Father, help us live your world for a world that needs, live your word for a world that needs to see it. In Jesus' name. Amen.